a welcome to this opening presentation on this strategic space for the space industry. So to get started, we'd like to get a sense of the audience this morning. So could you please raise your hand when you use an Apple iPhone? Don't be shy. All right. So what about the users of an Android phone? Who uses an Android phone? OK, anyone uses any other platform or no phone at all? All right, I see one person, great. So um, I think the audience here is about 50-50 about uh, between uh, Android and Apple. And if you actually look at the market statistics, it's a little slightly different. So it's about 70% of the global market share uh, is with, uh, with Android today. And as you also can see on the charts, you know, Apple obviously being the first coming to the market. But by 2012, already Android was the largest platform. Another way to kind of measure uh, commercial success is uh, looking at the app revenues, right? So in that case, actually, uh, Apple outperforms Android by a factor of two to one. When you look in, uh, you put kind of Apple and, and Android next to each other, uh, the kind of technical differences clearly stand out. So uh, Apple uses a uh, closed uh, source, source system uh, with only a single hardware vendor, while Apple, uh, while Android basically has an, an open source system with multiple um, hardware vendors, including Samsung, Google, and so on. And this design choice comes with implications. So uh, Android allows for more customization. Uh, well, Apple has a better network control and also typically a bit of a better performance. Now, when we overlay this SETCOM uh, landscape with um, this kind of Starlink, uh, list this Apple and Android uh, battle, kind of one clear pattern is emerging, and I think it's already depicted here, that Starlink resembles clearly this Apple concept. So think about it. We have a um, also a closed architecture. It's a proprietary user terminals that actually look very nice and sleek. Um, and as well, if you look at the development costs, it's been quite significantly high, right? If uh, based on our own estimates, the total capital investment into Starlink Gen 1 and Gen 2 amounts to $30 billion. On the flip side, there's the big question, uh, what is the Android ecosystem? So a little bit more about that later on. So as the iPhone in 2007, Starlink took the market by a storm, uh, especially in consumer broadband and maritime communications, where it has been rapidly growing market share. And if you look at uh, the past statistics, but also uh, where they are currently tracking towards, we, uh, we expect about a 64% market share in consumer broadband by the end of this year, and in maritime communications, uh, close to 40% market share. Another important point, also demonstrated on this chart here, is not only capturing share from existing players, but also grows the overall market. So there's also a very positive effect to that. Supply is typically considered as one of those indicators of the competitive positioning of operators. And, and clearly, uh, when we see the kind of continued massive uh, deployments of, of Starlink, you can expect that uh, they should sustain their competitive lead in the short to medium term. And especially as it takes still a number of years for the other players to, to launch, more like about post-2026, to have additional supply additions coming to the market. The other challenge of the, let's say, the others kind of category, which is highlighted here in, in green, is that it's a very fragmented market. We talk about 50-plus operators, all different sizes, also using different type of systems, uh, different orbits, different frequency bands. So all ma makes it a very fragmented uh, market segment. So really the key question here then comes to from, so how these players can build and create an, an SATCOM Android ecosystem that basically can effectively compete with Starlink and uh, rise the tide, lifting all boats. So in our view, uh, it basically the SATCOM Android ecosystem is built on four key pillars. And the first one is listed here, is access to space. So in recent years, the industry has been pretty reliant on SpaceX for, for launch. Uh, if you look in the chart this year, uh, from the 69 uh, missions, SATCOM launch missions, uh, 61 are expected to be performed by SpaceX. So it's evident there is a clear need to have more launch vehicles becoming operational, like Ariane 6, like New Glenn and others, 
to kind of avoid this potential bottleneck of, um, of in the heavy launch category. Number two, this is the uh, software-defined satellite infrastructure. So software-defined satellite, uh, if you can see as well from the recent orders, is really kind of a clear trend. So what is it really about? So software-defined is about standardization of hardware, as well as using software to manage the operations of these missions. Uh, and that's important because it increases the operational flexibility, especially in this pretty rapidly changing environment. So it's pretty important for an operator to remain competitive. It's also one of the points also to one of the biggest challenges today because initially the, um, uh, the competitive price, the short time to market were kind of advertised as the main advantages of software defined satellite. But in reality, right now, we're looking at prices that have substantially increased and delivery times mount up to three to four years. So it's a pretty important uh, to reverse that trend uh, to make sure you know, the satellite infrastructure network layer will become competitive. Number three, to basically use these satellite infrastructure ac assets, there is a need for this virtual ground segment. So what does that mean, this virtual ground segment? Well, it means the availability of multi-orbit terminals. It means the possibility to integrate it to the cloud, as well the availability of um, network synchronization software, network management software, and all built on open standards. Um, and this basically is also very important to uh, be able to integrate satellite in the wider telecom, uh, terrestrial telecom um, ecosystem. So virtualization is really considered as one of these key drivers for the cumulative 75 billion in cumulative spending in the ground segment that is projected between 2024 and 2030. Number four, the fourth and final layer is the pooling and sharing of resources. Um, basically, it's critically important to build partnerships and that's particularly to kind of get a real true global service availability. So um, as you can see as well, uh, for many, many operators, it has been very difficult to gain market access. It's kind of these key uh, challenges of any operator, including Starlink, as depicted here on the map. Uh, despite many efforts, they still uh, lack kind of market access in many of the Middle East countries, as well in parts of Africa and Asia. So all in all, the uh, access to space Software-defined satellites, virtual ground segment, and pooling and sharing of resources are kind of required to build this full-stack capable, capable Android ecosystem. So one of the questions we often get as well at uh, Nova Space is, is there really room for another player next to Starlink? And I personally believe so. That is definitely the case. It's also in nobody's interest to have a monopoly. And I already talked about the Apple and Android battle, which kind of also shows that um, this ba battle rivalry kind of inspired to get to greatest performances. But also if you look at the market data, there's definitely no reason to think there is a winner's take all market. If you look at uh, the addressable market and current visa penetration, there's a lot of room for growth. Uh, basically, if you look at through those numbers, uh, fixed broadband, for example, this is the uh, kind of under, un underserved or unserved uh, population, and this is even based on affordability metrics. Uh, current visa penetration is about 15%. Um, if you look at more the remote businesses or civil government sites, penetration is still below 10%. On the mobility side, uh, also significant uh, variation, uh, more penetration than the Aero IFC and rapidly growing, uh, but maritime only 7%, and land mobility more of a new emerging application less than 1%. And finally, defense, an, a market that has historically been a, a SATCOM user, but still only like 13% of the available kind of assets that could be connected are connected to Visa today. So that all to say uh, that there is basically significant room for growth, which is also uh, mirrored here in our latest services market forecast. Again, the, the overall thesis here is that with improved service offering, and uh, lower prices, we'll be able to increase market adoption. And when we look at the numbers, so from the data services perspective, we expect that to increase to 53 billion 
by 2033, uh, led by uh, the fixed broadband segment, representing about 70%, followed by mobility and defense. On the other side, uh, the video market, not talked much about it today. It's in a continuous decline. Uh, we project that now to go down to 63 billion by 2033. One interesting or important thing to highlight here in video, historically, we've already seen this decline in DTH uh, in the more mature markets like um, in North America, like Europe, but we also see now a stabilization in historic growth markets like um, Africa and India. So clearly, uh, this market continues to decline over the next decade. Well, my time is up. Uh, I hope you enjoyed the presentation. I wish you a great World Space Business Week, and I hope to meet you all later in the week. Thank you. Thank you.